Technology people come up and tell you about how technology is going to solve all kinds of collaboration problems. And that is largely, although we all now have a lot of computers and electronic health records in our settings, we still don't have as much collaboration as needed. Having us at the tail end is perfect because the collaboration is, part, is starting to happen and we can come up underneath it and help you have a space to write it down and have an institutional memory that can be accessed by multiple people. So there are several different pieces of technology that the IDN is helping with um, the project with. We're gonna show you just one of those today, and this is the shared care plan. Right? Probably 80% of what happens in with, with the members that we're gonna be working with is going to be going into your own health records, whether that's an EHR or a paper record, uh, but most of the real details are going to live there. For instance, Matt, when you do a, a, a session with somebody, psych notes are going to live sequestered away in an EHR system. There is mixed interoperability right now among the EHR systems. You know, we can get what's called the PAMI fields. Problems fly around pretty well. Allergies, we can get those. Medications, we're starting to be able to get those. And immunizations. Now, the physicians in the room, when they look into a record from somebody else, they immediately start and Correct me if I'm wrong, but they go, where's the notes? Where's the meat? Where's the beef? For those of you who have been around for long enough to know that commercial. Where's the good stuff that will help me treat this person right in front of me differently than I would before? So that's the stuff that does not travel between EHRs very well at all. And it's not expected to during the life of this district wave. So we are placing a big band-aid, a big three-year band-aid on this technology-wise that will get us the important stuff in a way that you can consume it and use it, knowing that over time, the systems that you are using are going to start to get better at this. Okay? That's just where we are in time with technology. So this moment in time, in 2017, we're going to have to do a little bit of extra work to get um, get the good stuff from one team to another. What we've done is we've put this idea of a shared care plan together. Okay. This is what the state proposed to CMS to bring in a lot of money to the state to do integration. They said we're going to create a, a core team that at least gets primary care behavioral health talking and supports that with some kind of a care manager or, or a caseworker, a community health worker. There's a lot of different names for that. Um, there's a, a care team coordinator is what Dr. Boat's team is going to be using up at Peter Road. But some kind of glue person, a uh, boundary crossing role, if you will. And then that team has to share information. That's a requirement. There's not going to be one way that information is shared. There's going to be a lot of ways that that's shared. But the, the stuff we're talking about today, the important stuff, will be shared through the shared care plan. And then the standardized workflows and protocols need to be built. We heard a lot about homelessness earlier, for instance. So we're developing a screen right now, uh, or, or we're, we're actually building upon the work of Dr. Kerrigan. Uh, and Mary Evanovsky in screening for homelessness and being able to have a pathway that goes all the way through to getting somebody to a housing authority and placed is a part of this. So we're looking at building all of those pathways for things that, that we all know we need. That's one component, it's called a core standardized assessment. So it's a screen up at the front that helps you recognize that something's happening with a member. Many of you, uh, or the members, we've got a lot of members that um, are, are family members or they're Medicaid members themselves and that have contributed to our process in the last year, told us that patient goals are really important, that there may be a provider-centric view of what's important, but patient-centered set of goals is, is also important. So a provider may be saying you really need to work on your diabetes 
where a patient may have the goal of having stable housing for the next two months be the top of mind. So that's one of the things that we brought in as well, is to have a patient-centered view within that shared care plan. The shared care plan itself, and then the, the moose in the room is uh, HIPAA in part two, and we're working hard to make it so that we can have substance use disorder treatment providers um, in this mix. We can't just say you're, you're out of this. So that's the mix. Interrupt me anytime, please. Okay. ARC has a very fluffy idea of what a shared care plan. This is the, the Agency for Health Research and Quality, the, the national organization, the authority on shared care plans, has an okay definition. There's almost no evidence on shared care planning. This is the Wild West. A few people have done it. A lot of people have blown this. There have been states that have poured tens and tens of millions of dollars into building gigantic health information exchanges that have longitudinal patient records and their adoption levels are under 10%. Right? So we're up against a pretty hard frontier. This is something that we're going to be trying to do differently than, than it's been done in many other places. And the way that we're going to do this differently is we're going to simplify as, as much as we can. We're going to get down to the very, very basics of what is most important to the clinical teams. And this is the list we've come up with so far and started testing with, with across a whole bunch of different people and we're going to be testing it vigorously over the next two months at the same time that we start using it. So we're testing, building consensus, using, testing, refining, rapid cycle, continuous improvement. We learned in Oregon that just having a list of care providers and their contact information is gold. Right? Somebody shows up somewhere, you have no idea what's going on with them. They may present like the case this morning of PTSD of a soldier and just having somebody to call to say, what is going on? I have a patient, we shared this patient together. Can you help me give me any information that will help? That is considered high, high value information. Any single one of us in an EHR might have a little piece of that member's constellation of providers. Um, Peter Mason gave an example when we met last and there were seven different teams working on one patient. Not one of those teams is aware of the other one. Okay? So this is just situational awareness of the others that may be working. A lot of action and intervention is possible just from that. The second thing we want to bring in is a patient-defined set of goals. And there's a lot of process work to be done to determine how that works best. Um, Dr. Mason, in his practice, uses this with some back and forth. He talks things through with his patients and they come up with a set of things to work on and most importantly, they prioritize them. So they, there's a top to bottom, let's work first on getting me out of my abusive housing situation. I need shelter tonight. And then let's work on a transitional um, uh, housing situation and then let's start working on uh, my severe anxiety depression and then maybe six months ago six months later we'll start working on my hyperlipidemia okay? those are those are my lists of priorities and to get those right up front in the, in the, in the shared care plan. the next big area is an area called health concerns and it's something that can house a lot of different things. It, it can house problems, it can house the results of all of those screens we talked about. Um, so we heard about the audit, the GAD7, the PHQ, you know, we've got a whole bunch of different screens. This is a good place for those to live. Like this person has screened positively for suicide risk and for um, anxiety, depression, and for uh, SED, whatever it happens to be. Um, you, we can put physical things in there, physical health concerns, we can put mental health concerns, we can put substance use concerns with a caveat that we have to deal with part two, but those, that is a place that those can live. And then finally, the plan of treatment itself, it's the action. 
So based on this and this, what is it that we can, we can start to work on with this particular member over time? Um, and um, this is an area where you may say, okay, we've got an open order, much like a medical order to a specialist. We're very good at saying from primary care, um, we've got a positive test for, uh, looks like a, a skin, I'm a perfect skin candidate here. So it was very, very straightforward to get me to a, a dermatologist. We should have a parallel process that gets us to housing supports, food security, um, all kinds of things that you're identifying are needed. So that planned treatment will have have that direction. Like we have an open order to get this person over to um, a program at Serenity House. Or we have an open order to get this person um, into a particular peer support program. And those can those can be open, closed, and we can have that whole um, plan live there. All right, there are a lot of, there are a billion things that are not in here. But these are the, the things that the electronic health records do not do well, the things that we think are the highest value for you. And we'd love for you to start testing this. And at the end of this, we'll do a little test on this, okay? We chose, and all the IDNs chose a, a vendor called Collective Medical Technologies. They're a relatively small vendor that cut their teeth out in Washington and Oregon states and reducing um, readmissions to hospitals. Um, they're very good in the areas of, um, of hospital, basically they, their, pro, their program was started with something called pre-managed ED. And it was designed to, to kind of redirect people that are, shouldn't be in the ED to more appropriate places of treatment. Um, and that's where they got their start. It has a, a lot of different features and we are, and they're small enough so they're able to come to us a little bit and fit what we need. So they're able to get our fields into their shared, shared space. Basically it's a shared space that we can, we can um, put those three or four fields into. They're able to um, control that access to that shared care plan in a very nuanced way that protects patient privacy uh, according to the laws. So if there is a, somebody with a HIPAA TPO relationship and somebody else with that relationship, both will have access to that particular record and they're able to manage, uh, manage that with a pretty big team. They have a pretty good event notification system with the hospitals that are participating. So we have six hospitals in our region, and right now we've got, uh, we're working on, Lebanon is already live with this, and we're working on the other hospitals now to get them hooked up. What that means is you get real-time knowledge of when one of the members that you work with shows up at an emergency department, when they're transferred somewhere like to New Hampshire Hospital, and you, they used to go into the dark hole there, you now will see that transfer, and you'll see the discharge, which allows many of you to, to take action where you couldn't before. You're thinking about Jessica and the, the thousands of different use cases that this will have in the middle of January as somebody heads out for a home health visit, wondering if they're gonna get paid for it and then finding nobody home because somebody's in the emergency room. Um, or, or Sue Ellen who's left, but who has people that are co-locating in emergency departments to do redirects in real time. And you'll, you'll be able to trigger some of those types of actions using this program. It also pushes part of the shared care plan up to the emergency department. So this is kind of a secondary use. We're using this mainly to coordinate our teams, but if you do have a Medicaid member that escalates and shows up at the emergency department, um, that care plan gets packaged up and put on the ED tracking board for the emergency docs to look at, and they can see what's going on. Um, you know, going back to the, again, the soldier example from the beginning, it would have been helpful for somebody to explain that if that particular person was showing up in the emergency uh, department doing that, you'd be able to say, oh, actually this person is, is um, uh, has these these particular things going on. 
And then finally, there's some hospital visit history that comes with the program. And if we can get the state to go through with this, we're going to get another view of the prescription monitoring drug program. I said that in the wrong order, um, which is the, the database that that the prescribers of controlled substances are mandated to go and look at before they prescribe. Right? So that's an extra data source that we can put right in front of people, which gives you a lot of information about what may be going on on the SUD side or the pain management side for a particular person. That's what's coming together with this product. We were going to demo it today, but they were struggling because we asked them to redo their fields. Uh, so this is a screenshot of what they had as of Friday, and hopefully this will be ready for our rollouts in late September, early October. Right? It's really, really simple, and we we cut away a lot of what their product had in it just to get to the basics. Care providers are automatically set up here. Those are for the hospital, so anybody who can produce an admit discharge transfer file or a registration file. Uh, for those of you who are technical, you know what this is. Um, that will automatically populate. But for everybody else, we'll just be adding those providers. So we'll have a care coordinator or um, somebody who's, who's at the center of this universe adding those providers. Okay? If you think about our shared case conferences that we're supposed to have on complex members, it's a monthly case conference. Somebody will be saying, okay, this the constellation around this particular member are these three organizations. Let's get the contact information right so that we can coordinate. Okay. Very tactical. We can just get that information, get that in there right. Patient goals, it's just a text box. We're not going to start by codifying and trying to overdefine what's in here. We're going to leave it open for a while and let that um, over time build up some some um, convention okay? so we're going to keep that straightforward same thing health concerns um, which is uh, either a caregiver or a patient concern will be able to go in there we should have one-to-one -one relationship in there with the positive screens that that we get from the course standardized assessment so all of that should should be the results of those screens will be right there and then the plan of treatment at the bottom. Um, these are dynamic, so they may be updated. Um, the other thing that's tricky to get your head around at first is this is not a shared, true shared document that, let's say I entered this in, and then let's say Bill saw one of my patients. He can't go in there and change my record. His organization is going to have another tab here that's going to be identical. So there's a, there's a concept in, in, it's probably based on legal liability of data providence. So you have to have you know, one organization lined up with one record. Okay. But we, this, this particular vendor allows you in a case conference where there's three different organizations just to have one person take the notes and then copy those over to the other care points. And it also has some ability to flag discrepancies. So if you, much in a social media way, like in Facebook, if you saw something that you thought was, you know, shouldn't be on Facebook, you, there's some ability to flag it for them to look at it. For instance, if you saw something that was wrong on somebody else's care plan or that was out of date, you'd be able to get some information to them to make sure that stays the same. Syncing these things is gonna be a challenge we'll have to figure out. But the alternative was to have one care plan we never would have gotten past any lawyers. All right, so that's all I have for presentation. What I'd like to do is we've got a little bit of time for questions or to test it either way. Um, so Mark, so I didn't realize this. So there's the Dartmouth-Hitchcock tab and then there's the West Central tab and the patient goals that are under one won't necessarily populate to the other, is that right? So let's put it in, in real time. Let's say you had your, fir your first case conference between the heater row team and um, let's say it was Matt and Dr. Bo and Chelsea and somebody from Sue Ellen's team and a case manager hired by West Central uh, and a case manager hired from 
from Peter Rowe. He had, he had that group of people in the room. They all have a relationship with the patient. Somebody would say, I'm gonna take point today on recording, recording this, but it's going to be tied to my organization. So let's say, let's say it's somebody from Matt's team, from the Heater Road team. They write up in this Dartmouth-Hitchcock tab the patient goals, the health concerns, and the plan of treatment. And then after those professionals um, disperse, the coordinator on that team could replicate that out and put it into the other tabs. Um, there's, there's some nuance to why this is needed. Um, the main the main piece is having that direct line between a legal medical record and what's here. The second way is that constellation of providers changes over time mm -hmm. when those patients move. So if you've got the same record associated with multiple points in that network and the patient moves over here, that continuity can continue. It, it does create some noise though. Yeah. It seems a little bit, of, you know, that's the concern. Yeah. Bill. How does this work with other agencies that don't have EMRs, social service agencies? How does the plan get to them? So the, the plan is accessed through a portal. It's a cloud solution. So it's a second click to somebody. Um, so let's say your workflow is you usually go to your EHR prior to seeing one of your patients. Somebody on your team will also go in here and they'll say, is there anything out, out in the shared care plan that, that um, uh, Dr. Gunn should be aware of before the appointment? And they would bring that to you. Um, so this is the biggest criticism of this, is having clinicians go to a second place can be the kiss of death for information. It will only work if it's, it's of extremely high value. Um, and what we've learned, what we've learned with the health information exchanges over the last 10 years is you can't just put it there and hope it's discovered and used. That's not enough. Um, the early projects have started to hire roles that are specific to doing some of this work with a human. And having somebody that, that has part of their job description, a new person with a new salary paid for from the federal money Part of their job is to get over that hurdle and get that information to the team with the hope that that role goes away over time uh, or goes into somebody else's role. But initially, we need somebody that's entering here. We need somebody who's looking at this as part of their workflow when somebody comes in. It should prove out pretty quickly. We should see people are either going there or this is six months from now we should have enough evidence to know if this is worth pursuing this 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 will be pretty clear yes so to follow up on that so in, in the, um, for dartmouth hitchcock facilities that are on epic they'll have to leave that like the emergency department people will leave their epic and go into this and then enter this information each time a person comes in so if you take a Cheshire, let's take your, your co-located practice that you're going to put in MFS. They would work in Epic to chart 80%, 90% of a patient visit. Then they would go in here and they would chart the things that needed to be shared with that greater team. Remember, this is only for high complexity patients. We're not going to chart everybody like this. This is people that need um, a lot more coordination than a, than a usual Medicaid number. Right? Um, so most of your charting still happens the way it always did in Epic. This goes out so that um, when somebody from Phil's team uh, needs to access what happened after they walked you down the hall, that number down the hall, this is where they would go to see what, what had happened. And I, I'm trying to keep this simple, but it's actually more complex. The, the, the goals are the two systems, um, was Lavender and Wyatt and Epic, they work okay together. So we're still gonna be sending back something called a CCDA document, which I've got a cheat sheet on. These fields should be flowing between 
those two systems. So, so um, demographics, health insurance information, problems, allergies, medications, immunizations, vitals, lab results, encounters, procedures, and some social history can be going back and forth. And that's, that's different from the shared care plan. We're trying to keep these records synced. But these things don't go part, back and forth very well at all. So that's why we're keeping those in the separate application. So, uh, back to the I get it for the B1. But I'm just thinking from, because my understanding of our startup is with the ED, so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. So the ED physicians get a push to them. They don't have to go anywhere. They've actually, this vendor is packages up what the care plan pieces are, and they put it right in the Epic tracking board, which is, so if I, I've got this board of 10 patients that are currently in the ED, there's an icon that lights up that says there's extra information on this person right? and you may be able to look at that um, for lower tech places i actually boston medical center right now is shut is having that just sent to a nursing station on bright orange paper so they know whenever the orange piece of paper comes out of printer two that that's extra information that the emergency team can use and they're doing that to avoid the integrations expenses until they prove it works um, so it's cheap and easy. It should become pretty obvious whether they look at this information and find it valuable or whether these things just end up in the recycling bin. Yes? Can you have uh, those two tabs look at the same time so I can see patient goals side by side? Or is it only one tab at a time? Uh, these three things show up all to, like this is an entry screen. Once these are entered, there's just goals, health concerns, plan of treatment for one facility, and then a second one would require another click. It shouldn't be a big deal to ask them if we can put simultaneous like split screen, because the information's there. That's just presentation. Yeah. So if this is a vendor that's anxious to learn with us, and to so if there's unit like UI type, let's try to make this more usable, I'm sure they'd be open to doing things. And from, just from a uh, minimizing click standpoint, are those going to default open? Or is it going to take one more click to get in? I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. I, yeah, I first got my hands on this Friday, so. Um, it, yeah, we'll phone that up for you. Just from another kind of detailed question, when you're looking at the care provider list, mm -hmm. um, I think it, without having a spot for contact information, unless that person is local, um, as the as the case manager, I might not have to not find that with that information. So if somebody's coming from Nashua, just a name is not going to help kind of locate yeah. that organization because it just has a provider name and then the type, whether yeah. they're mental health. So you're still kind of searching. We've asked them to blow this out. They have a mouse over functionality so you put your mouse over and it gives you the full demographics oh, that okay. provider perfect um so but the fields are all there okay um and more importantly we're going to have the phone numbers we'll have the direct addresses as well yeah. so we can say hey can you send over our care summary via direct because i've got this patient coming in tomorrow and i'd like that i'd like my summary so we'll have all the contacts yeah what about uh, social service agencies like Transport or, or Home Health or uh, any other agency that's not necessarily a provider per se? The HIPAA is really well developed for covered entities. If we go one level out from HIPAA to non-covered entities, there's a lot of value in that and there's an extra step of getting a consent from every patient before we can share that information. Um, there's an in-between which we can have those, those organizations listed here and we can have them included, but they will not, they'll, will not be able to read certain fields. Yes. So Mark, I think I heard you say earlier that this was designed for really the, the high risk or the high need patient. So is there an algorithm to decide who, who gets to use this, or is it the provider that 
decides that? Yeah, this 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 tool doesn't care who goes here. Uh, so that is that is a clinical decision. Um, we're trying to, you know, there are other technology streams. One is data analytics, and with the idea of how can we define subpopulations that should be getting enhanced care coordination. Um, and there's there you could do it by a lot of different factors, and we're trying to figure that out now. Um, for starters, we're going to be looking at least at ED utilization. We're also trying to put the lists in front of the teams of the Medicaid attributed lists and have people actually self-select a starting cohort to say, let's just start with 10 to learn in October from our list of 50. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll load those registration files up for those into here. Um, and then, um, we also are doing data aggregation, which is a continuous improvement product for, for clinical reporting. So you'd be able to use that to identify things that would help you get to higher risk or higher, um, higher complexity patients. So. This all informed consent signing from patients to be able to share with you. There, this can work without informed consent up to a point. This can work um, strictly under TPO if everybody has a relationship that's either because an organization has contributed data that establishes a relationship or a care provider can declare a relationship to a member. That, that will work without consent. The places where consent comes in is if you have a part two provider that wants to contribute information, they need an authorization to disclose. Or if we have anybody that's a, not a covered entity, to, to your question from Ascoma, if we put a transportation company had access here, we would need a consent to share out to those organizations. So I recently had a case where it took me two days. I need it. I was not part of Mascoma. I had my other hat on from the town of Canaan. In order to go forward with a plan, I had to have verification of certain facts out of the electronic health record. It took me two days, a fairly coercive discussion with a release from the patient before I was able to obtain that. There's nothing in the system that's going to allow me to do that. Yeah, okay. Probably needs more. I, I would need to understand your situation a little better. I have a patient. Yeah. I have a person who comes in. Needs to have a transportation system, needs to have. Um, uh, counseling on uh, employment needs housing. In order for me to do that, I need to know if, in fact, that person is on Suboxone, what level is a, is, a, is a medication, what do the records look like. She stated it's X. I need to verify whether it's actually X or whether it's Y. I get a release from the patient. I call up West Central Behavioral Health. I call up uh, Diamond Hitchcock Psychiatric. And I don't get through for two days. In the meantime, I've got it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that particular situation would be solved by this, but that is a that is a crux problem that's been identified that the IDN as a whole is trying to solve. Um, we've heard a lot about people hiding behind HIPAA or not understanding Part Two. And uh, Dr. Mason and I have been spend, spent the summer um, use, with our, our CHI counterparts working through a lot of that. And our, our goal is to get that education out to all of you on what is actually permitted and what's not, and to help those work better. Is somebody looking at a way to facilitate that happening in the future? In other words, I've got two attorneys looking at it now to see what we can do about it. The question is, are you folks doing that as well? Yeah, my goal is to have a more robust system that gives more information to service providers so we can actually do something in a time, timely manner. So to me, looking at it as a, as a lay person, it's all about releases and disclosures. If in fact I can create a system of releases and disclosures, is there a legal vehicle that would allow me to get more access to different agencies to fix the problems. You are bringing up incredibly 
one of the biggest moose on, in the room. And, and it's gonna take probably a few sessions, at least a few sessions. We've got some people looking at this closely from a lot of different angles right now um, because the federal rule part two and HIPAA are both gonna be stressed by the nature of the populations we're, we're trying to give enhanced care coordination to. So um, let's, let's keep talking that through. I, can't, I don't have probably enough time to kind of go into it right this second. Uh, I've heard indirectly that there's a that there is a practice by providers with electronic health records to dummy down the comments that are in the case notes so that they're somewhat vague. This is even more vague than that, I think. So have you looked at it to see exactly how useful the data is going to be to another provider that's coming into the case new? Yeah, there's no intention to make this vague. This, this should be pithy, very clear, short statements that help coordination. Um, because, oh, because that information right now is buried, there's no way to dumb it down to get around part two. Part two is such a tight, it, it was written in 1977 or something like that, that, and has been updated a few times. But um, we're not gonna be able to just hint, like nudge, nudge, this might be a Suboxone user. And that, that creates a patient safety issue that no provider in the room will tolerate. So we will not ever go down that road. Um, so. But thank you for bringing up the, both the part two issues, the disclosure issues, those are huge. The technology can help us a little bit navigate those and the computers can help us track the consents. The actual disclosures are, that's a human legal set of constraints that we have to crack as a group here. Yeah, I think we're running up against the time, so maybe one last thought. You've got one in your head. I'm, I'm just excited. Okay. <laughs> so I, I mean, I just, I'm excited and I think it's a lot of the work that's, it just makes it a lot easier. So I'm just thinking of a person who had just discharged and it's, you know, at the hospital, we got halfway through disability stuff and, you know, the community people need to pick that up and it's a lot of, this is what I did and I need you to do this. And so I'm just excited. <laughs> Let's take that as well. Thank you. All right, thank you all for attending, and we're, we'll wrap up for the next, I guess, eight minutes with the full group. Thank you. One last thing. Sure. So, you create like a sandbox or something for all of us to play, and then we can play together, and then you can sort of work out some of the bugs because I know for me, I do much better just playing with it and learning it that way rather than um, having it explained to me. I did ask for that day if we're not able to provide it to the vendor. I can ask again. Or we can take, yeah, we'll figure that out. We'll get you. All right, thank you. We will have this rolling out to the projects that started in September. We'll have this rolling out to you in October.